So how are we going to assess the amount of pain one of our patients is in? Well, usually the answer to this question is remarkably simple. Now, let me ask you, is pain a sign or is pain a symptom? Well, obviously pain is a symptom. It's not something we see, it's something the patient reports to us. And this takes us way back to 1968 and the most famous quote in pain management from Margot McCaffrey. And it goes something like this. Pain is whatever the patient says it is, existing wherever and whenever they say it does. So if the patient says to me, I've got a pain, that means they've got a pain. If the patient says to me, I've got a really bad pain, that means they've got a really bad pain. If the patient says the pain's in my elbow, that means the pain's in their elbow. It's that simple. The patient is the only arbiter and judge of their pain, and we have to believe them. It's that simple. Or is it that simple? Because nurses and doctors are absolutely rubbish at believing their patient's pain very often. Very often you'll be talking to a patient, you'll assess their pain in great detail, and at the end of it they'll say something, you know, that is such a relief that someone at last believes me that my pain is real. This means they've been to nurses and doctors who really don't believe they've got pain. Absolutely terrible. We have to believe our patients. If the patient says I've got a problem, they've got a problem. It's that simple. Don't complicate it. Now I know you get conditions like Munchausen's where the patients say they have pain and they don't have pain, but not very many. Not very many. In my experience, there's probably more patients under-report pain than over-report pain. So don't worry about the obscure conditions, just worry about the 99.9% .9 of your patients and believe exactly what they say. Pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, existing whenever they say it does, at whatever level they say that pain is existing. It really is quite simple. Now what else can we say about pain? Well, we should assess pain when the patient is at rest and when the patient is moving. Now, this can be particularly important in the surgical situation, in the post-operative situation. A patient might be lying there perfectly still and in bed and their pain can be low. But then when they move or when they cough or when they take a deep breath, the pain shoots up and gets way worse. So there's no point you assessing the pain when they're lying there still. Because if they can't deep breathe and they can't cough, they're going to get hypostatic pneumonia and die. If they can't move the legs, they're going to get a deep venous thrombosis and a pulmonary embolism and they're going to die. If they can't move, they're going to get pressure sores and infections and osteomyelitis. All the complications of immobility. So we have to assess pain when the patient is still and when the patient is undergoing activity, like deep breathing or coughing. Another thing to assess pain is before and after analgesics. So we want to know what level the patient has before we give analgesics, especially in the acute care situation. And we want to know how much pain the patient has got after the analgesics. That way we can evaluate the effectiveness of our, our, our analgesic intervention. We have to know if things are working or not. Now, normally I assess pain with uh, adults and even children on, on a numerical rating scale. And it's as simple as this. Zero is no pain. Ten is the worst possible pain you've ever experienced. What number is your pain? And as long as we take our time to communicate with our patients on this, an individual patient will usually be, usually be quite consistent. So before analgesics, their pain was a six. After analgesics, hopefully their pain's down to a 2 or 1. One patient can be quite consistent with a numerical rating scale. 1 to 10, I normally find the, the most effective. But you can have visual analogue scales as well. Sometimes you'll have, for children, you'll have like a very crying face and a not so crying face and a normal face and a happy face. And you can ask them to say where they are on that continuum. Or you can have a line 
really bad pain, no pain at all, and just ask the patient to mark where they are on it. That, that's another way to do it. Or you can have a verbal rating scale. Would you say you have no pain, mild pain, moderate pain, or severe pain? That's, that's another way you can do it. Of course, some patients have more than one pain. And if they have more than one pain, if they have pain in two parts of the body, then we should assess each pain separately and monitor the progress or deterioration of each pain separately and also monitor the effects of analgesia on each pain separately. Now, everyone in the world who does any clinical work at all knows what PQRST is. P is atrial contraction, QRS is ventricular contraction, T is repolarization of the ventricles. Everyone knows that. They don't stand for anything in, 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 in the cardiac cycle. They're just PQRST, they're randomly assigned letters. But it's quite good for assessing pain. We can write down PQRST and then assess the patient's pain using the PQRST of pain. And P stands for provoking factors. Tell me, what is it that makes the pain worse? Is there anything makes it better? Is there anything brings it on? Is there anything that relieves your pain? What are the provoking factors? The P of pain. Q is for quality. Tell me about the quality of your pain. Is it deep or is it superficial? Is it crushing? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it gnawing? Is it burning? T tell, tell me about the quality of your pain. PQR. R is for region and radiation. So where is the pain? You can even map that on a body outline if you want. Where is the pain? Whereabouts is it? How much area is it occupying? And is it radiating anywhere? Is it referring anywhere? So region, radiation, referral. Where's it going? Does it start somewhere and then go somewhere else? Region, radiation, referral of the pain. S is for severity. How bad is the pain? And for that, we can use the numerical rating scales we've just discussed. T is for times. What are the timings of the pain? When does it come on? How long does it last for? How frequent is the pain? The PQRST of pain. And by the time you've sat down and gone through all those with the, your patient, we can learn quite a lot of clinical diagnostic information about that from that we can start to infer what's wrong with our patients. And the fact that you've done that in detail means the patient will really get the, the benefit of believing that you are taking the pain seriously. And as we've already said, that can help. Now, I'm not saying there's no signs of pain at all. There can be autonomic changes. So classically, in pain, we are taught that the heart rate goes up, the blood pressure goes up, the respiratory rate goes up and the patient becomes sweaty. What you would expect from sympathetic stimulation. And this is very often true. When someone's in acute pain, typically their heart rate goes up, their blood pressure goes up, their respiratory rate goes up and they become sweaty. But it's also possible that in pain, the vasovagal parasympathetic effect can predominate. So some patients in pain will get sympathetic stimulation, yes. Other patients will get a parasympathetic vasovagal sort of response, mediated by the vagus nerve, which of course is the 10th cranial nerve, the body's main parasympathetic nerve. What will that do to your heart rate? What will vagal parasympathetic innervation do to your heart rate? Well, that'll slow it down, won't it? It'll allow your blood vessels to dilate. It'll reduce your respiratory rate. So actually, with a vasovagal response to pain, you're actually going to get a hypotensive bradycardic response. And there's been some recent research carried out on this, um, actually. Um, people who have what's described as an extrovert personality tend to get hypertension and uh, tachycardia with pain. People who are described as a, a neurotic personality type, very often the blood pressure goes down and the pulse goes down. 
quite how you define those personality traits, you'd have to do psychology tests. But the point is, know this. No, clinically, you need to know this. Very often when patients are in pain, yes, their blood pressure will go up and their heart rate will go up. But in a fair old sized minority of patients, in many patients, when they're in pain, the heart rate will go down, they'll vasodilate, the blood pressure will go down, and of course that makes them feel faint. You can have a syncope with pain mediated by vagal parasympathetic um, activity. Children, of course, are very hard to work with uh, if, if they're you know, young children. In my experience, the main way I can tell a child is in pain is by the type of cry. Now, I remember when I was a, a young student, I was on a ward with two very experienced paediatric nurses. A child would start crying and they'd say, don't worry, that's not a painful cry. Another time the child would cry and they'd say, oh, that's a painful cry. You just get to know the difference. There's painful cries and non-painful cries. So if you're working with children, you, that is the sort of thing you'll get to know. Look at their facial expressions, the crying, the physical movement and their vital signs. But it is hard to tell with children, so we need to assume that they are in pain whenever there's any reason to do so. And of course, neonates, young children who can't yet speak, feel just as much as pain as anyone else. And it's absolutely horrendous to think that not that long ago, maybe as late as the 1970s, you actually had anaesthetists who believed that children didn't feel pain. Now this is, this is a horror story. But they believed that young children couldn't feel pain, therefore you don't need to anaesthetise them. Just, just give them a muscle relaxant so they don't squirm about. Don't worry about it because they don't feel pain. The... the, 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 the Criminal arrogance of that is just beyond belief. Thinking that I'm so clever I know someone else doesn't feel pain. Neonates do feel pain. And of course we now know that fetuses feel pain as well. Now you can argue about what stage of pregnancy the fetus starts to feel pain at, but there's no question that uh, a fetus is sensitive to pain. In the later stages of pregnancy there's no debate about it in the third trimester, but you know, nervous tissue develops on, from very, very early on in, in fetal development. So if there's any clinical procedures being carried out on a fetus, they should be anaesthetized just the same as anyone else should be anaesthetized. And while we seem to be talking about age, of course, old people feel, the, feel pain pretty well the same as anyone else. Um, we always have to assume all people are able to feel pain, even if they can't express it because of Alzheimer's disease, for example, and uh, treat it um, as we would want to be treated if we had that amount of pain.